Good afternoon. Welcome to Our Legacy. My name is Jackie Francis. I am the president of the board of directors at the Queer Cultural Center, and I welcome you to Our Destiny, the 25th annual National Queer Arts Festival program. This year, our theme is inspired by these words. If mankind is to have not only a future, but a destiny, it must consciously and deliberately be designed by poet and activist June Jordan. We are happy to be in community and in celebration with you and our artists today to honor the incredible past, present, and future that is the destiny of our own making. To honor community care and wellness, this year is our very first hybrid festival with in-person and virtual gatherings. Our aim is to produce a festival where each of you can participate in a manner that feels safe and good to you. Because of the current city and federal standards, each NQAF event and supporting venue looks different. To take care of our community, we have asked all artists and our team to be vaccinated and to be present and to present to us a negative COVID-19 test using rapid tests that we have provided. At all our events, proof of vaccination and masking is required for entry. For outdoor events, we encourage masking. In addition, we have mask and hand sanitizer on hand, and we ask you to join us in masking and in holding our community in safety together. We encourage you to turn on the exposure notifications on your phone, and if you test positive for COVID after this event, please send an email to production at queerculturalcenter.org. Your information will remain confidential. Before we begin our wonderful show for you this afternoon, we want you to know what's coming up at the festival. On Tuesday, June 14, there's AIDS Diva, The Legend of Connie Norman, at the Roxy Theater at 6.30 p.m. On Thursday, June 16, there's the 45th, featuring Dazier Grego Sykes at 6.45 at the Little Roxy, also on 16th Street. On Tuesday, June 21st, there's Vibe Music's Ghetto Gospel, 7 p.m. at the Chapel on Valencia Street here in San Francisco. Um, if you love this show today and any of the other shows, please encourage people to watch them in the festival. You can read more about the entire festival by viewing the festival events at queerculturalcenter.org national hyphen queer arts festival backslash or follow us on social media at QCCCSF on Facebook and Instagram. Lastly, we have audience surveys. Audience surveys will be sent to you via Eventbrite after the show or can be found on our website as a scannable QR code or as a printable QR code handed to you when you enter the show this evening. These surveys will help us not only ensure that we're fulfilling our mission, give us information to share with our funders and community, but to also find out what you want to see. Please take a moment to fill them out. They're very important. Now I'm going to turn it over to Awan Mance, who will be the facilitator for today's program. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Great. Uh, welcome. Thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, our, this afternoon really is dedicated to hearing uh, the stories of how QCC has come to be from the people who were there and made this happen. And so um, I will introduce myself. I'm Awan Mance, um, and I'm an artist and an educator living here in the Bay Area. I live in Oakland. And um, if all of our panelists, one at a time, can uh, tell us a little bit about um, just your name um, and uh, oh, maybe a couple of words, because we're going to get into this more, about your relationship to QCC. Um, I'm Pam Penniston, and I was, I guess, maybe the, actually the second executive director and then artistic director for Queer Cultural Center from before, 
from the before times, not meaning pre-pandemic, uh, until 2020 sometime. Is that right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, our dates, you know. Um, yeah, so I've been a part of it for a very long time. <laughs> My name is Lenore Chin. Is this working? Let's see. Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's closer. Can you hear me? Closer to oh. you. Oh, good. Okay, my name is Lenore Chin, and I was one of the founding members, along with Pam and Jeff and a few others who aren't here today. Um, and I was the board president for 13 years, which is a really long time for uh, that kind of position, but Pam outlasted me on the board. Uh, but anyway, I'm a painter and photographer and I was uh, involved in the Harvey Milk Club uh, many, many years ago, which is how I met Jeff and we'll get into all of that later. Hi, my name is Jeff Jones and I was the uh, one of the first uh, people to even think about this item along with Lenore and uh, Greg Day who is not here today but he's from Los Angeles, he's from Palm Springs now. Um, and I just wanted to um, point out that our original name was QCC, the Center for Lesbian, Gay, tri trans Bisexual, Transgender, Art and Culture. And um, we knew we were going to call it Queer Cultural Center, but we didn't dare name it that because we would have never gotten uh, our nonprofit status from the IRS at that time. Thank you. Um, and I, as a way of getting into our questions, I'll mention that I'm also a new member of the QCC board, and I've been in the Bay Area since 1999. By the time I was here in the Bay Area, the QCC felt like an integral part of community, and I didn't know any Bay Area without it. And so today I have uh, some questions um, that I'll be asking the panel, but I also want to leave time for this to become a conversation um, for the panelists amongst themselves, but also with you. And so. Um, I'll just get us started um, by uh, asking our panelists um, and if all of you would like to respond or um, one or two, um, you don't have to respond to any questions that you don't wish to um, address. Um, <laughs> but if you can tell us a little bit about a different version of the before times. Um, uh, what, do you, what do you remember or what are you aware of about the status of queer arts in San Francisco in the, say, late 80s, um, early 90s, before the work towards building QCC began? Well, those two have much more to say, because I didn't even get to the Bay Area until 1986, and I wasn't really thinking much about arts. I was thinking about, because as a lesbian, you know, I moved here with my partner, and then we broke up, because that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> So I was just interested in trying to hang on and lay low in the weeds for a while and start my design career. I'm a theater designer, so that's what I was doing, but they know about what was going on. <laughs> well, uh, we were starting to reminisce about what it was like that far back, into <laughs> the last millennium. <laughs> and um, uh, in terms of visual artists, it was like people would throw together what you would probably call pop-up uh, spaces, wherever, wherever we could find a wall or whatever. And so uh, years and years ago, uh, Lauren Hewitt ran a place called the Clementina's Bay Brick Inn. Um, it's in this neighborhood, uh, was. And uh, uh, that was where people like Marga Gomez and Monica Palacios got their early start. You know, they, they had, it was a club, and they had some art. Um, and also, uh, in terms of some of the early performance spaces, there was um, Josie's Cabaret in, in the Castro, and uh, Valencia Rose on Valencia, and that was a, what did we decide it was called? No, 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 it was a crematorium or a mausoleum, one of those. It, it, <laughs> was, it was a funeral home. Anyway, talk about getting whatever space you can get. Um, 
And some of us, the artists in the area, kind of met each other over a period of time, like at street fairs. Some people would, you know, show their work at street fairs and things like that. You know, uh, some of the guys would probably show things at, you know, Folsom Street Fair, and they had their own thing going on. Um, so it, it really uh, didn't, it wasn't like anything like today, many, many years later, you know, so we would try to find whatever venue we could. And I was part of a group with Richard Bolingbrook and a couple of other people uh, who would, you know, create little exhibits here and there. And the biggest one we probably had at one point was at the City Hall Rotunda. Um, so it really was a handful of spaces. And, you know, that, that's how some of us started started bubbling and Jeff and I met through politics and and he can kind of go through some of the back story of how he and Pam and Rudy kind of connected and got things going okay I hope I can um, I moved here in 1979 and when I moved here uh, there were you know this was the only um, this was the only place in, ta in the country that it felt safe to be out of the closet. And I had already written about 30 or 40 successful grant proposals in Austin, Texas. And I came here, uh, and I was here for the Dan White riot, and I had such good time rioting <laughs> that I decided I'd move here. <laughs> so I did. And uh, suddenly, I was like writing grants for uh, Theater Rhinoceros and for Frameline. And I wrote both of their first grants in 1981, I believe. And um, there was John Sims, who started the Gay Men's Chorus. And there was a women's orchestra started by Elizabeth Min and uh, Miriam Abrams. And then in 1984, both John Sims and Alan Estes, who started Theater Rhinoceros, both died of AIDS. And from that time, uh, from 1984 onward, really, basically, nobody uh, wanted to contribute to the arts. It was just not what was happening. And I, myself, became the grant writer for the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. I was the first paid person there. And I was also the first paid person for Open Hand, and for uh, and I wrote the early grants for the quilt project, the AIDS quilt. And around 1986, 1985, my partner died of AIDS, and I felt like, okay, I've paid my dues here, and I'm going to go back to the yards. And I worked for the Mime Troupe and the Ethnic Dance Festival. And by 1988, uh, it was very clear that there was major problems because the NEA started censoring people. And then there was the Robert Maplethorpe uh, exhibition that was censored. And um, the NEA went on the warpath of all LGBT artists. And one of them is sitting right here in the front row, Annie Sprinkle. Uh, who became embroiled in this controversy over, uh, you know, what is art. And the, in 1989, the, the National Endowment for the Arts, which we all pay taxes to support, announced that um, LGBT artists would no longer be funded by that agency because our experiences were not um, qualified to be taken as serious, uh, could not be uh, depicted in any serious work of art because we were basically frivolous and all about sex. And then, the year after they announced that, Angels in America won the, the, every award in theater possible. Uh, but that, that particular moment was when we started talking about, okay, what are we going to do here about uh, getting queer artists funded? And that was one of the reasons that we started QCC, was because we knew that we could not allow San Francisco to go the same way as the federal government or the state of California. And by actually getting in their faces, we were able to stop that approach. And in fact, 
the first grant that QCC got was from the California Arts Council because they uh, really didn't want to be associated with the federal government. So a after, I would say around from 1983 to 1989, there were virtually no new LGBT arts organizations. And we could see that ultimately there was going to be money for this in the city of San Francisco. And unlike most nonprofits, QCC, we formed a board of directors and filed for nonprofit status, even though we had no money. <laughs> we just took the Ada Rhinoceros's uh, application and Changed did things. word, you know, word processed. Uh, take out Rhino and put QCC in there, and we sent it in. And lo and behold, we got nonprofit status while uh, Ronald Reagan was the president. <laughs> and so that's where we came from. And you know, then there were other things that went on in the late '80s that uh, uh, helped us, like the, um, like I said, when the federal government announced we were not eligible for funding. That helped us a lot because most of the progressive funders were just horrified that anyone would say that. But it was true from 1989 until 2009, a period of 20 years, the federal government did not fund any queer arts organizations. And it was QCC that ultimately was funded first by Barack Obama. So that's basically the nutshell. <laughs> I had a, a little question as part of the backdrop. When did you do the, the Jones report? Jeff Jones. Yeah, because somebody actually asked me about that recently and I really had to go back and explain what that was all about because that was sort of the backdrop of our networking ultimately. Yes, In 1986, I did a study of how the city of San Francisco distributed its arts monies and I discovered that people of color and the queer community got a grand total of 5% of the money, even though we were like 75% of the population. And um, so I published that report and I became the persona non grata, the barbarian at the gate, as I was described as, by, <laughs> by uh, the funders and the and grants for the arts. I was like ostracized uh, from the so-called arts world, uh, but I really didn't care because as soon as that happened, virtually every single arts organization of color called me and hired me. Directly. <laughs> so, so that was what happened from there. It was 1986, 1987, I put out another one. And then there was a scandal. Then this scandal is like really, really where the, the impetus came. This was um, the Grants for the Arts decided that they were going to hold a festival in 1990 to demonstrate that I was wrong, that in fact they did fund people of color. So they, they spent, I don't know how much money, they held this festival and they, the festival got to day three when it was canceled because it went bankrupt. And the three that, uh, that they did have was really great. The first one was Bill T. Jones. The second one was um, the Oakland Youth Chorus and uh, Bobby McFerrin. And then there was going to be an exhibition with Bernice Bing and Flo Wong and the first Chinese American visual arts uh, uh, exhibition that anybody had ever heard of back then. So it went bankrupt and then they had this uh, hearing where the, the, everyone fought over who was responsible to pay all the debts of the festival that went bankrupt. And the Board of Supervisors were furious about this because they had like a room full of screaming artists saying, I can't pay my rent because Festival 2000 owes me $100. <laughs> it was really great. but. Uh, I had it all set up that I would be the last speaker and I called for the formation of a task force <laughs> and yeah. this, this task force was the one that recommended the cultural equity grants program and on that task force was Brian Freeman, and Pam Edison, Rudy Lemke, uh, Miriam Abrams, a whole bunch of people 
that are still around here. But I'll let pa Pam tell this story <laughs> because <laughs> this so is really <laughs> the juiciest political <laughs> discussion of where QCC actually came from. Oh, yeah. So one day, um, I had been working at Theater Rhinoceros, and one day I get this phone call from this guy. I had no idea who he was, and he said, you have to get in touch with the supervisor. You need to either talk to Roberta Actenberg or Carol Migdon and get appointed to this task force. And I went, and you are? <laughs> and it was, of course, Jeff Jones. <laughs> and I had no idea what, it, I mean, I knew about what had happened with Festival 2000 because I happened to be the set designer for the Bill T. Jones, Rodessa Jones, and Idris Akamore show that was the first show that happened to open the festival. And one of the other things you should know is it wasn't just, although it focused on a lot of um, in-town artists and Bay Area artists, it also brought in artists from out of town who were therefore stuck here with no fees. Now, I should point out that the person that they appointed to curate this festival was from out of town, who spent most of the money, we're told, on coffee mugs that said Festival 2000, which I'd actually love to get my mitts on <laughs> right now, <laughs> and, um, and furniture for his office and things like that. So, and it did not take in very much money in those first few days. So it was horrible. So I get this call and I think, okay, well, and it's like, well, Ad Adele Prandini's moved to uh, Pacifica, so she can't be on the task force and she recommended you. So I said, oh, okay. So I got in touch with Roberta Actenberg and met with her and we discussed the things I wanted for the arts and she talked and we got along famously and so she, I became her appointment. Now, the festival, the um, Cultural Affairs Task Force ended up being 54 members. 59? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, right. How unwieldy. <laughs> yeah, it was completely insane. I mean, and all of the people who were with the so-called majors, that is the major arts organizations who were getting the big bulk of this funding, opera, symphony, ballet, that group, um, they all wore red blazers to show, I don't know, what, but it all meant we're not giving you a penny, you little scrum, you stay in your corner. Um, and so we had this meeting, and we had many meetings, and we weren't getting anywhere, and it was making us all kind of crazy, because we could not make any inroads into, into their avarice. <laughs> and the, so one day, I was still working part-time, as I was until two years ago, with a law firm, and I had a half day. So I came over to where we were going to be meeting early, saw a sheet of paper that said agenda, just grabbed it, put it in my bag, thought, oh, I'm way early, I'll go have lunch. Came back, we had the meeting, it was another sort of screaming match, and then the progressives all met at Joan Holden's house, and we all sat around and went, what are we gonna do? What can we possibly do? And I took out the agenda, and I looked at it, and my jaw dropped. <laughs> and I handed it to Joan, and I went, short hairs. <laughs> and she grabbed it. It was an agenda of the meeting of the major arts organizations who had hired a lobbyist who was going to help with city money, who was going to help them subvert this entire process and give them instructions on how to do so. Everything was outlined in this <laughs> agenda. And we were just like, whoa. <laughs> so, so for years, everybody kept the fact that I had found this secret so that we wouldn't get suffer the backlash, not that having Jeff Jones on your board wasn't enough of one, but, <laughs> but 
yeah, they kind of, uh, you know, everybody said, oh no, we don't know who found that. So, um, and what Maria Costa did was we made zillions of copies of this and invited the Chronicle and all the other newspapers, queer and straight, in town to come to this meeting. And we passed out a copy of the agenda as people came in. And Marie Acosta did the, <laughs> the most amazing performance. I am so distressed over this. Or <laughs> she was one, wasn't she? Um, it was a war memorial. She was yeah, she was with. She was an actress with the mind trip. Oh, yeah. She, well, she was an actress with the mind trip, but she was also, wasn't she already on Grants for the Arts war review war panel? War, war Memorial. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> war Memorial. Yeah, so she was with the War Memorial plan, and she was just like, oh, she, it was great. Not a dry eye in the house. And I will never forget the look on the head of the symphony's face as he realized what he was holding in his hand, and he looked over at the woman from the ballet and said, they have the memo. <laughs> <laughs> We have the memo. So, um, so at that point, it was simply a matter of our trying to find a way to make this work. And Marie and Jeff and I met at the telephone booth bar, <laughs> a 2,000-year-old uh, gay bar on Valencia, and um, tried to hammer out details. And the details that we came up with were that the hotel tax fund had been growing by percentages every year. And what we could say to the majors was, we're not gonna take any money away, but you are now effectively frozen. You aren't getting any more. And all of the rest of this money will be used to establish the cultural equity funds to create the cultural equity initiative, which was a series of grants to small and mid-sized organizations, individual artists, for the first time, there were no grant programs because nobody trusted individual artists to actually do what they were going to say in their grant proposal. So we managed to get that um, in and they had to gulp, but they had to say yes. So that's kind of how the funding for the three additional cultural centers, us, the Native American Cultural Center, and APIC, housed here, the Asian Pacific Islander Cultural Center, got our first bits of money to begin operating programs. I, I wanted to jump in, and you guys can recollect with me. Uh, at some point in there, the bunch of us formed the Consortium of Neighborhood Cultural Centers to strategize about funding, pooling our resources, and things like that. I remember there's a picture of us that might still be in the Chronicle somewhere where we all sat or stood under Dewey Crumpler's mural at the African American Art and Culture Center, right. which that wasn't the name then. But Maria yeah. X. Martinez was there and, and others, Cole was it, Thomas was yeah. there from from ACT and all of that. And, you know, so, uh, yeah. And so we started meeting there to, to just sort of, you know, solidify uh, our, our numbers and, and all of that. And to get the, the formal joining of these cultural centers, SOMARTS and Bayview Opera House and um, SAC, which had been WAC and then was ACK. Um, <laughs> at that time, it was the Center for African and African American Art and Culture. And who am I? Oh, and Mission Cultural Center. And so the seven, who can say no to the seven of us, you know? We were representing various cultures and people and that had never been represented in the arts before. And we used that to try to also get our artists, our queer artists, into other identity places. So coming into here, doing uh, exhibitions with SOMARTS, doing things with Mission Cultural Center, so that people could see that truly we were everywhere. And yeah, we had an agenda. <laughs> 
I'd like to add to that that <clears throat> this happened separately after the cultural equity mm -hmm. grants mm -hmm. program was established. Um, and at, at one point, Jack Davis, who was really the founder of SOMARTS and really one of my closest friends, he and Maria Martinez, who uh, was the chair of the Mission Cultural Center Board and then on the Arts Commission, we waited until it was election time <laughs> when <laughs> Willie Brown was running for mayor. And we went and met with Willie Brown, who had never, he knew Jack Davis and he knew Maria Martinez. He said, oh, you're Jeff Jones, the arts terrorist. <laughs> I was like, this was like right after 9-11. But anyway, uh, we knew that this was like the time that we were gonna get Willie Brown, who was running for election, to uh, increase the funding for the cultural centers. And we managed to slip QCC and APEC, APEC and, and the Native American Cultural Center into the mix. And he increased the funding for these centers, which were probably, at that time, $500,000 each per year to weigh, it was $500,000 for all of them per year to way over two and a half million. Today it's like three and a half million. But anyway, it was, it was mm -hmm. in both of these instances, we achieved cultural equity through the political process, not because we were waiting for some foundation to be nice. <laughs> we knew that if there was any place in the world where we had enough political power to make this happen, it was here, and that's what we did. So, uh, and it's still, I think the long range thing that we can see is that 25 years later, there really is an integrated and very vibrant cultural community in this city where people are not begging for crumbs like we used to be, uh, but are now actually funded. And I noticed that the grants, the cultural equity grants program just got an extra $1 million from London Breed. So there we are. She giveth and she taketh away. <laughs> I want to ask, oh, Lenore, go ahead. I was thinking back, but I'm, I'm sort of flashing in and out of, of the little tidbits because uh, we were chatting about some of the things that we also did we went down to the city hall at times I was down there with Jack Davis and some others lobbying you know for for you know uh, funding or supporting the bond issue or you know things like that so that was sort of our political acumen that we you know lent to the process of trying to kickstart all of these other projects and you know we shared spaces like they said you know that was one of the things that we did to to pull our resources, you know, to survive. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this is the best yeah. I do um, have a little bit of a follow-up, and so it's not on my official list of questions. But um, and so, um, is it fair to say that the querying of arts funding in SF also brought an unprecedented diversity across other axes as well? And if so, why? Well, because queers are indeed everywhere. <laughs> we make up every group, um, every immigration status, every ability, every everything. So we were one of the logical groups to begin to knit these other organizations together because we wanted, and I will never forget, during much later and more annoying person in charge of AAACC who wanted to know when we had worked with the curators over there, the twins who are now the directors, uh, Melanie and Melora Green, we were going to have a, uh, an exhibition there in June of Nancy Cato, very talented, wonderful, queer cartoonist and, and illustrator. And the head of it went, well, why can't they do that someplace queer? Why do they have to do it here? This is also the woman who said, well, what is a cowrie shell anyway? And yes, she was black. Um, so, so that was just the kind of thing we wanted to break down, was to say yes, and our black queer artists belong in black spaces. 
and our Latinx artists belong in Latinx spaces so that we could get people into their home bases and be visible there. That was such an enormous thing, was getting all of these different communities, these at once seen as disparate communities to kind of ooze together more. And that, because we were who we were, <laughs> um, and our, you know, when we, the things that we did add to uh, the bylaws that we stole from Rhino <laughs> <laughs> were that the board of um, directors always had to be a majority of people of color and the organization had to be run by someone who was a person of color. So those were things that we wanted the community to know that we were putting our organization where our mouths were. <laughs> I, I also wanted to add, as a backdrop historically, there, there were a lot of little nonprofit arts organizations that came into being in that time frame, late 80s, early 90s, and whatever. Uh, one of them was uh, Lesbian Visual Artists, which was organized by L.A. Happy Hider. Um, and that kind of was an outgrowth of a uh, Dynamics of Color conference that, that was held at the Women's Building. And she created LVA, which later was renamed Lesbians, Lesbians in the Visual Arts, uh, it, to include people who were not necessarily artists per se, but were you know, part of various um, other organizations and you know, administrators, things like that. Um, a part of that was because uh, uh, lesbians were not necessarily represented even in the gay organizations. Um, and a lot of them were also primarily white. So uh, Happy and a group of others, like Adrienne Fouzé, who was part of our QCC board, um, she's no longer around, unfortunately, but she was also part of LVA. And so that ran for a number of years, and uh, uh, we also had exhibits around town at Mission Cultural Center and, and things like that. So in the absence of major arts institutions that would meet our needs, this is why play, you know, organizations like APIC and Asian American Women Artists and others like that came into being. And over the years, because of all of these activities, we were able to identify who we were, you know, because we were operating in a, with similar visions, but in different spaces or venues or, or what have you. And ultimately, you know, there's been a lot of intersectionality, if you will, back in the day. So it was a very, evolutionary process. And if I may steal your question away again, <laughs> one of the things, this is just to show you how long ago this was, we had a series of community meetings about what did the community want to see from a queer cultural center. And I remember we had one at, at uh, Rhino and somebody said, wow, was this a long time ago? Well, we have a lot of spaces for art Oh, sure we do. <laughs> um, not now. But then there were a million small venues that were not connected. And what they wanted was somebody who would program and recognize a lot of these spaces and these people for doing this work primarily as volunteers, you know, for ages. So that was something that we also knitted together, was to be the big fat spider in the web of queer arts and feel when things were trickling, to, oh, here's something on this line, let's bring them in and let's bring them in. And, you know, for, for us, I think, for all of us, using politics, which these two were masterful at, um, but also because what we wanted more than anything was to set up our own competition, to grow other arts organizations at our scale or beyond our scale, to, you know, to people them with people who worked with us and who were, you know, right there. So we had still here, we had, you know, we had, um, Galleria de la Raza, who was way older than we were, and all these organizations that we worked with, and all these artists who were part of these organizations, to get them the 
help that they needed to be exhibited or find performance venues and to help them with that as well. So it kind of um, walks us into the question, my next question, which is um, um, about the obstacles that you encountered in trying to establish uh, QCC. What were, and you all might have different perspectives on this, but what were the biggest obstacles you encountered and how did you navigate around those are, or are those continuing to be obstacles? <laughs> now, the biggest obstacle was funding because yeah. the federal government was saying no, you know, no, mm -hmm. no. And it was the foundation world back then in the 80s was really, let me give you an example of how awful things were. In 1984, uh, Theater Rhinoceros created a show called The Aid Show. And not a single foundation or government agency would fund that show. And it ran every night for six months. And then it went to the Kennedy Center in Washington. But not a single foundation in the Bay Area, not even the Zellerbach Family Fund, would give us uh, even $1,000 for that show. And it was because a lot of the people in the foundation world were gay or lesbian, but they felt that if they funded any organization from our community, they would come out of the closet and they would lose their job. And that was, that was really true at the cor in the corporate world where people were just terrified that they wouldn't fund anything. It was only after AIDS became something that the population discussed and people could see what, how awful that was that, that uh, the funders were able to say, okay, well, maybe this five to 10% of the population deserves to be uh, not put in concentration camps like they were originally talking about in the early part of the AIDS, fan, AIDS uh, conflicts. So uh, that, it, that did not go away easily. You know, we did not get many foundation grants for a while, but because we had this uh, commitment to always having a person of color being the public face of the organization, then um, they were able to, they didn't know how to deal with that, really. And so they eventually started breaking down. But really, the, from the beginning, our goal was get government funding that's the easiest to get because you can use political pressure to get you funded. And that, that system has worked very well for virtually all communities of color as well as the queer community. And I, I don't think it's that much after, after Obama broke down the federal government's resistance to funding queer arts organizations, um, the rest of that went away. I'm, I don't know, I mean, QCC's budget is like over $900,000 now, so obviously uh, somebody is funding us. <laughs> Anyone else want to weigh in on that or? Well, you have to remember when we first started out, this was way pre-digital. So, this, this is an old, this is our first uh, National Queer Arts Festival uh, exhibition, little catalog. I, I actually went back to City College and took a course in cork, if anybody even remembers what cork was. <laughs> I don't think it's even around anymore. Now it's like InDesign and other things. But Rudy Lemke and I were the organizers and co-curators of, of that project, and we had 80 artists in this room. And it was pure madness because we were accepting 35 millimeter slides and everything was like, uh, our applications were like hard copies. There was no, there was no online, any, any submission forms or anything like that. So, and you know, we didn't have the benefit of people like Matt McKinley to, you know, install. So it was me and Rudy and whoever we could recruit to, you know, fill this whole place with not just 80 artists, but each one probably had several pieces. You know, and um, so so that was sort of how we kick-started that festival, which was 1998. 
you know. Uh, so I think we've come a long way since then, or QCC <laughs> has. Now we're retired from that. But, you know, that, that's what we were dealing with at the time. Not only less funding, but also, you know, you had to have skills, you know, to put this whole thing together and do outreach. And, you know, we did postcards you know, in, in those days. You know, it's not like Facebook yeah. and Instagram and other social media to get the word out. Oh yeah, we had to have postcards and we actually had to have a publicist. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was, that was something. FACE was remarkable. It was um, an exhibition of self-portraiture in the queer community. So again, it was that idea of here we are, we're queer, live with it. Um, we're on your walls. And so it was beautiful to see that huge grouping of people and their work and the differences and the the scale and just this is our community and that was really important to start off with that as our kind of initial statement I love the way that your responses are kind of leading into the next question here, um, because one of the questions that I, I have to ask, um, and Lenore, you've already started pointing in that direction, what is the role that the rise of technology has played in, um, what has that meant for QCC? Well, it's meant we could continue, <laughs> or we could even kickstart. Lenore did the first newsletters on her computer and mailed them out. In fact, I remember, <laughs> because some of them were against, like grants for the arts and things like that, had things in them, at like, oh, the Jeff Jones report number two is coming out. And, <laughs> and um, Carrie wanted to know, who the hell is this person, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but we, yeah, we couldn't have continued growing in the way that we were growing and reaching out to new artists and eventually getting international platforms if there hadn't been the interwebs. <laughs> well, the, the other thing also, uh, I was flashing back to people like T. Corinne and Harmony Hammond. Harmony Hammond did a, a like it was like a groundbreaking book that I was in, uh, Lesbian Art in America. And uh, through T. Corinne, who also unfortunately passed away, um, a lot of us found each other through gay newsletters and gay newspapers all over the country. And she was good at collecting and archiving who's doing what across the country. And she had found a way to um, insert herself in, in academia through the College Art Association. And she would go to all these conferences and everything. They, they'd have one like once a year, uh, usually in the dead of winter. <laughs> the flights were a little cheaper, but it was really cold, but she encouraged me to come to a few of those events. But what she did was she identified who we were. And, um, and ultimately, because of her work and meeting other people like Harmony, some of us began appearing in these publications that were actually taken seriously. And, and so it was a lot of that networking, like Tirza Latimer, she used QCC as a resource for some of the work she was doing. Um, so we, we networked across academia as well. And so that kind of heightened our visibility and our uh, status, you know, in terms of being recognized and taken seriously for our contributions to the cultural landscape. Uh, and so that was an integral part of our partnerships. Um, so I'm curious, um, I'm learning so much about, uh, about the Bay Area, about the rise of queer arts, and, um, and I'm wondering if there's something about, and there may be many such things, is there something about the queer arts community of the 1990s um, that people today don't understand, but should understand? I think in the 1990s, until we got to the point where we could stage the first National Queer Arts Festival, that it was just hit or miss, you know? One year in June, there'd be three or four events, and the next year, there'd be almost nothing. And it just, well, I remember when we started, and we said, well, let's, you know, the director of this building then, Jack Davis, was one of my closest friends, and he said, um, 
how about we'll give you the free use of this building for 30 days for a grand total of $3,000. I said, sold. <laughs> and we had that operate until Jack died, that's what we paid here. Because he was thrilled. This building was very underutilized until that time. I mean, it was very, you know, it was, there's no bus lines that really could bring you here. And it was kind of isolated. Nobody knew what SOMARTS was. And the main thing they did was visual arts exhibitions, really good ones. It, it was also a very different building. There was no Trader Joe's next door. The roof leaked. <laughs> Yes. Rivers of water would come through. The bathroom was in a little corner. You might still see evidence of the old plumbing in the front corner or whatever. So, you know, it really got spiffed up over the years as they accumulated more funding. Yes, and the most thing I remember about this building in the, in the 90s was that it had no heat. <laughs> so that when you came here almost any time, you had to really get dressed up you know, wear a lot of clothes, because <laughs> it was like 50 degrees in the year. Uh, and, and it was one eat. of those things where my nieces always say, Aunt Pam, why do you send us sweatshirts in June and July for our birthdays? And I went, oh, that's kind of our winter. <laughs> you know, after four or five o'clock, it gets really cold in San Francisco. But they could never understand why in October and November, I'd be sending t-shirts, but in June and July, I'd be sending sweatshirts, so. <laughs> but there, there was something else about that period when this, this, there was a lot of repression nationwide. Um, you know, there was the, it was the, the, the super ending of the AIDS crisis where people were dying at incredible levels until 1994. And then in 1992, the first um, drugs came along. But until then, it was very amorphous. There was a lot of people in the community here who were artists because this was the only place queer artists seemed to come at that time. And um, there were lots of little tiny things. I remember when we started QCC, we said, okay, let's have the whole month of June. We will just program the whole month of June. Uh, other people felt like we couldn't do that because we'd be competing with them and that wouldn't be good. And I kept saying, well, it's sort of like in New York on 34th Street, they have all of the major department stores <laughs> and people will go to the department, even like Union Square. It has that, that it would have that, um, Phenomenon, and I think that that has borne out over time because now, just just turn on KQED, you know, and see about their endless and en Channel Five, and now they advertise June is the queer month of whatever, and you know they have these endless shows that go on all month long. Well, KQED didn't televise anything about queers until the 90s. When they did the AIDS show. The AIDS and they show. actually um, didn't produce it, but they took the film that was made of the AIDS show and they actually showed it. Yeah, and that was when I moved here in the, in the early 80s, there were massive um, complaints to KQED because they never, they never showed anything about our community on KQED, and yet they wanted us to contribute all the time. <laughs> and I remember there was a meeting at, I think it was Harvey Milk, where, no, maybe it was Alice B. Toklas, where they brought in KQED and um, <laughs> United Way, and we asked those people what they do for our community, and, and the guy from United Way said, well, what do you people need anyway? We said, have you heard of AIDS? <laughs> and the guy, oh yeah, AIDS, this was like not, 1981, this was like 1985. They still were like oblivious to what was going on. But that was the, the way that um, we sort of operated then. But I think also just one observation I've had is that in, the, in the, our early festivals, we had a lot of national artists. Like we had second year, Bill T. Jones was here. Sec and the third year we had 
Adrian uh, Rich. Audrey, Lo yeah, or Adrian, Adrian Rich, Rich. Rich. Yeah. yeah, and um, that kind of thing. I, I don't know. It just disappeared as we went on, and I think it, it's probably time to go back to that idea of having national uh -huh. people at this festival. Yeah, yeah. We had a lot of um, literary folks too who were may be living here, but like when Jewel Gomez moved here and um, Alice, Walker. Al Alice Walker, we had at a festival along with Dorothy Allison and Jewel Gomez. So we had one bill at the women's building that was, people were up and down the blocks trying to get in um, to hear those three people read. And it really was an amazing thing. But a lot of our transfer for some of that became, well, we were working with other organizations, so if they were doing something that was queer-based, we would feature them in the festival, which gave them additional exposure and gave us additional events for the festival. So, but then Jeff developed um, creating queer community. And this was, I think, one of the single biggest engines towards artist development, queer artist development in San Francisco. And what initially CQC did was to teach, because most of the artists we were dealing with were maybe mid-career, some emerging artists, but it was a lot of people who just couldn't get beyond a certain point. Um, they were glass ceiling way too soon. Um, and this was Jeff doing a seminar on how to write successful grants. And this, again, got people thinking about how do you talk about your project? How do you not seem like, I'm just a dizzy artist and I'm going to do this when I have time? No, no. <laughs> so it was just make them know that you understand the business of them. Make it, you know, and he emphasized all these things for artists to grasp a hold of, and he talked about the tenets of it, and I would come in on day one and tell them what the theme of the festival was, and they could ask me questions, and it was, he would say, look, you have your funder in the room, so just ask any questions about your project. And then at the end, they would write sample grants, and people would look them over. And then we convened a mock SFAC, San Francisco Arts Commission, panel. And we would talk about their grants in front of them. And just like on the panel, you couldn't say a word about it <laughs> until we were done. So it could, it let them see where adding that one thing took us off and in an odd direction and didn't focus on what they needed to be focused on or, you know, so there were a lot of things that people got from these, um, these sessions. And I think maybe the first one had like, we narrowed it down because we could only handle like 15 or 20 people initially. And then we started getting 75 people at the pre-screening <laughs> and you had to write a little one-page simple proposal to get in because we had to get it down to something we could work with and out of the maybe 30 people or so who would go through this process 15 to 20 would get funded and they may not have gotten huge amount of money but they also got their venue and technical expenses taken care of plus publicity. So a lot of that was really, you know, pivotal for us expanding the arts community and small arts organizations. Sean Dorsey came to one of those early on in Fresh Meat and it was actually, I can't remember her name, Diana, I think, who, uh, Campo, who first came with the idea of doing a queer women's film night, which she did for a year, and then she said, well, my teacher, Madeline Lim, teaches this. And so we invited Madeline to host the next one, and now you have Quack Map. And um, 
So we're raising all these organizations and we're loving the fact that they are in competition with us. You know, we didn't ever feel like, oh, we have to get every grant. You know, it was no, our communities have to get every grant, <laughs> you know. So that was kind of what we were after. And uh, we expanded the program two or three times, one to include emerging artists who really didn't understand about the grant writing process yet, but who needed to know about doing their own publicity and presenting yourself in grants versus publicity versus, you know, these different languages that artists have to speak. So we just kept adding segments to what creating queer community would be and programming those people into the festival when possible, so. And I'd just like to add that when I think about what QCC did in, in retrospect, I think that's the greatest thing that we did, is yeah. we inspired and provided the skills to many people so that they could advance as organizations. I'm looking in this room here and I see Natalia here from uh, Still Here, who is now the director of QCC, and uh, Annie Sprinkle and Beth Stevens, who now have uh, Earth Lab San Francisco, Sean Dorsey, who now runs Fresh Meat, Transgender Film Festival, Madeline Lim, who was just mentioned, um, and Radar, which, mm -hmm. which yeah. started with Michelle T. So there, there were, those, are, those are still ongoing organizations that uh, came out of QCC. And that's the bizarre thing that Pam keeps going back to, is that we, we did not see ourselves as the only person that we were concerned about. We saw how do we build this entire community by providing uh, not only funding, but also the technical assistance that allowed these other groups to emerge. And the fact that they're still here uh, is really great. Let's hear it for these and that's an amazing legacy for QCC, and of course QCC is ongoing. And so my next question is about this ongoing nature of QCC. We're in an interesting time. You mentioned Robert Mapplethorpe and the backlash in the late 1980s against particular queer artists. And in some ways we could say that today we're in a similar moment uh, with a backlash against um, you know, queer novelists, a couple of California-based, one Bay Area-based, uh, graphic novelist, um, you know, uh, Maya Kobabe, and then uh, the California, often in the Bay Area, um, Mari Naomi, um, um, their graphic novels are among the most banned. And we see backlash against queer performance in various parts of this country. And so, um, not wanting to say that we're come back full circle to where we were in the late 1980s, we're in a very different place. But keeping that in mind, and keeping in mind your legacy of building new organizations. Um, what do you hope or want or believe will be the future of QCC? Well, that's a question for the people who populate QCC now. Yeah. <laughs> we ran away. No, I mean, we retired. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, we want to see it still obviously serving the community and bringing people along with them and uniting groups because we are in the same place. We. Uh, you know, it's not just Roe v. Wade, it's not just going to be women and childbearing age women. <laughs> it's going to be women and then it's going to be, it is, queers and especially trans people and then it's going to be, you know, all queers and then it's going to be, you know, so people of color, giantifically. So I think the thing that we hope that the arts will continue to do is to hold up what is going on and say, and you need to act against this. You need to be part of these organizations. You need to bring your art to do service to your community because that's 
that's another thing that we've always done is to push our artists to engage their own communities in whatever areas they were in and to open their eyes about some issues that were happening. And I think that that, for me, that's something that we still will need to do very, very thoroughly. Well. <laughs> it's hard to. <laughs> yeah. I, I would just like to, you know, sort of echo what Pam was saying. That, you know, with all of our rights being under siege again, you know, it's nonstop really. If people have to remember, you know, that the things that happened prior to us, prior to our generations, they can come back and hit you right in the face. And if you're not vigilant, our rights will be taken away, and that includes our culture and our histories. They could be totally erased. So it, it's up to succeeding generations to be equally vigilant to ensure that that doesn't happen. I don't know. I, just, I uh, left QCC in around 2018, and I continued my uh, professional career as a grant writer, and now, um, I only work for queers and people of color just like I did for the last 25 years. But I do notice now that um, in the black community especially, um, that that seems to be where I've ended up. Like I had never met Awan until today, except I told her, I put her name in all the grants that I write. <laughs> because I write the grants for an organization that she's on the board of, uh, or is a curator for, right, yeah. an arts group called Black Women is God. And I also work for the Triple ACC uh, organization, which has two lesbian twins as the directors, mm -hmm. and they are really uh, a force to be mm -hmm. reckoned with. And also I work for, um, the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area Theater Company, which the artistic director is queer and is just really one of the most dynamic people in today's arts community here in the city. And he's only 31 years old. So I have great hopes for what's happening in the, in the black community, the gay, the, the queer black arts community now too, which, uh, you know, has always been there. If you think back on Jewel Gomez, mm -hmm. you know, you just can, Brian Freeman, you mm -hmm. just go back Almost to Afro really Almost. important people. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so there. But I, I think looking backwards, I can see what QCC has done. And now that I'm not really attached to it, it's easy to, to sort of uh, put that in words. <laughs> Whereas previously, you know, it's like when you are guided by the tyranny of the day-to-day. -day. I used to call it whatever comes in the door, you have to deal with whatever crisis. It's hard to see in retrospect what has happened, but, you know, I'm getting pretty old now, so I, <laughs> I can sort of see uh, what QCC really means. And I'm very pleased that I've had the experience to be part of this organization. Well, um, time has gone by uh, quickly, and I want to make sure we have time for any questions or comments. But I do want to ask one more question, one of my own questions of the panelists, and that is, um, what are you working on now? <laughs> now that you have some more time, stepped away from QCC, um, what, are you, what are you working on today? Well, first I got married. <laughs> <laughs> And Lenore was our wedding photographer. Um, and um, uh, I'm, well, and then I have to clean out the garage because I'm married. <laughs> um, but I'm working on um, some booklets of writing and sketches and things that uh, illustrate family stories that just like the queer milieu is they, our memory span is like, oh, I want to do this. And it was like, yeah, you know, 20 years ago, we did exactly that show. But, but make it now. 
because that things were different 20 years ago. So it's okay to do the same thing, but you ought to know that we did do the same thing. So it was, you know, it's that kind of respect for the past and learning from the past that's really important. But I found out when my, I was hanging out with my sister in Tennessee, um, in Nashville, and we were having a conversation. I said, you know, I've always loved this photograph of you on these steps. It's like it was professionally lit. It's gorgeous. Where was that? And she said, oh, that's when we lived in Brooklyn. And I went, we lived in Brooklyn? <laughs> I had no idea because I wasn't born yet. So I just realized that a lot of the stories and ideas that I hold, they don't know about. And, you know, so I've been talking to my cousin who's 10 years older than I am and my sister who's five years older. And I've been working on this, as I said, series of stories and ideas and writing and memories to give to them. So that's been big fun. Okay, uh, here's my announcement. Uh, in 1999, uh, well, 1998 actually, uh, the late the Bernie Sping, who was the f first executive director of the what was called the South of Market Cultural Center, which is SoMart's now, uh, passed away at the age of about, I'd say, 63, something like that. She was young, uh, but she was very sick. Um, she was a lesbian artist, although she was uh, not exactly out in those days. It was a very different era. Uh, however, uh, she was very involved with a lot of the cultural landscape at the time. She was part of the neighborhood um, arts program, which evolved into what we now know as the San Francisco Arts Commission. Um, she was a close friend of Jack Davis, who was the uh, executive director here. And so when she died, Jack said, you know, I'd like to have some kind of an exhibition tribute for her. How can we put this together? So thanks to Jeff Jones, he wrote a grant. It took a while to come in, but he wrote the grant that facilitated that project. It was a huge community project. Um, and it was nested in the, our sort of second festival and included the Asian American Women Artists Association. Um, it, it was called They Hold Up Half the Sky. And so it was a, a two program event, great turnout. And that was the beginning of a lot of little projects that those of us who knew Bernice, otherwise known as Bingo, uh, would create. We would get little exhibits together, try to get her into uh, uh, publications, uh, you know, because she did have a history during what was called the Beat Era. Uh, she was involved with in North Beach as an artist. She went to California School of Fine Arts, which later became the San Francisco Art Institute. So she had a long history. Um, over the last 23, 24 years, uh, there's been a core group of us who have been pushing to make sure that her legacy is remembered. Madeline Lim worked with the Asian American Women Artists uh, Association to create a documentary film about her called They Hold Up Half the Sky. After all of these years, the Asian Arts Museum had expressed an interest in the possibility of acquiring her work after seeing a big show of hers up at the Sonoma Valley um, Art Museum. And so uh, within the last year, th uh, after negotiations with the Bing Estate, uh, Frida Weinstein closed the deal, and the Asian Art Museum now has the largest collection of Bernice's major works. Stanford University has her ephemera. And in the end of September of this year, they are planning to have an exhibit of her work uh, sort of back to back on the heels of the Carlos Villa show, which just opened, um, well, it's opening this week, at the Asian Art Museum. So, and they were very close also. They both went to the California School of Fine Arts. So it's sort of a major event, especially for a museum uh, of that status, to have two people of color that we've known for many years 
but their histories in, in, in their contributions to the cultural landscape have been virtually erased. They, they didn't get the, the notoriety that they should have in their day. Carlos has gone too. So um, look for news announcements to come. The Asian is working on some ideas for programming that hopefully will you know, reach out to our allies in various neighborhoods, queer or non-queer, to be able to participate in some way. So that's my big announcement. I like Pam Peniston. I got married last year for the first time in 50-something years. Uh, and then, um, and like I said, I'm working um, primarily these days in the black community. But I, I also um, live half the year in Austin, Texas. And for me, this is like a major challenge because I go back to where I came from there in the 70s, the 60s, 70s, and my whole perspective on what's going on in Austin is guided by the way that the history of racism in the city has been totally suppressed. Nobody has any idea of what Texas has been like, and there's no written history of how the whole state has been dominated, first by deciding that they would um, wipe out, eradicate all Native Americans. They did that. Then they took all the land from Latinos who already lived there. And they, of course, there was slavery. And the whole state has been in denial about what the historical record of, of Texas is. And that's something that I'm somehow, I know that's coming for me. <laughs> because I go back there and I could say, you people could get so many grants here <laughs> just, to, just to write up the history of Austin, which is now everybody's favorite American city, if you notice. And um, nobody knows any of that. I mean, they, they have no clue of like what the history of that state is. And I know everyone watches on TV and watches some of these lunatic politicians talk to you, that's what people think about Texas. Yep. And that's in fact what it's like, except in, <laughs> Austin, except in Austin and somewhat in Dallas and occasionally San Antonio. Anyway. Now, uh, Frank, first I'd like to give a hand to all of our amazing panelists. Now, um, as you can see, there's a lot of wisdom and knowledge and perspective here. And so, do you have any questions or comments that you'd like to make? For the whole panel, if you could have done anything differently, what? Regarding QCC, what would that have been, if anything? Oh, wow. Um, stop the earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I say stop the earthquake is because, you know, the ho we depend on the hotel tax. And when the quake happened, subsequently a lot of our money, and we weren't getting huge amounts then, was slashed. And as I recall, Jeff and I paid out of pocket from our day jobs <laughs> a, a portion of the ending of that festival. But I don't know, differently, um, I think it would have been to speak with every board and new staff member about this history and to bring them up to speed about why things were weird and why this went this way and this person did this and this because we grew so organically and bizarrely you know doing what we needed to do that it became just the way it was and I think we would have benefited a great deal more if we had explained earlier on to each subsequent group of staff why it was that way and how it came to be it's not like we had a template for doing things. Like a lot of the um, uh, 
nonprofits that sprung up to address various concerns about, you know, around AIDS and HIV and all of that, you know, like the food bank and Ruth Brinker's, you know, projects and all of those sorts of things. They, they kind of got invented as we went along because we didn't have models prior to that, you know. So, you know, we would meet in Rudy Lemke's studio for years hashing out ideas and what ifs and where can we get money and how are we going to put various things together. I think in retrospect, like I said before, I think um, I wish we had continued presenting nationally significant queer artists as we went along, um, but uh, we did get diverted by creating queer community, which focused us totally on uh, supporting the development of queer artists in San Francisco. Not that I regret any of that, but um, I, I do think that in retrospect, that's something that should have been continued as opposed to abandoned. But also, I think um, it would have been great if we had written, if we had somehow documented each festival in terms of written materials. Because while we have all of this in our heads, uh, we're going to die soon. <laughs> and, you know, if, unless it gets written down, this is all going to disappear. And it's great that this is being uh, videoed so that um, we will at least have this particular uh, item as a source for what our opinions the, are the, uh, at this moment in time. Um, the, the other thing that, I, that you should be thankful for is the website that Rudy oh, created yeah. because that's like the Britannica of queer arts as far as what QCC had done. I mean, it's got like thousands of pages, web pages, I'm sure. And Bertie Spring is part of that. That's yeah. still the go-to resource for finding out who yeah. she was and what she did. And a number of other artists, all the bazillion artists that were featured over the years. There, you know, yeah. there's pages for all of them. Yeah, every single artist. When, in fact, when we had our 10th anniversary, we presented the um, Gay Lesbian Historical Society with uh, what we call, Rudy and I called the big boy, which was we gave them the real ephemera, but we also gave them a printout of every page that was, you know, because the pages that were on the website contained the longer explanation. It wasn't the 20, 25 words in the catalog. It was the 150 to 200 word part description of the event, it was the bios of all the artists, it was the photographs from that. So each of those things were part of that original website. And we, we couldn't even, we couldn't, so, yeah. So they have the archive somewhere? Is it digital format or actual printouts? Well, I don't know what was fully transferred when we moved to the new oh. platform. So yeah, because there's like it, thousands of pages. Oh, I'm there sure. were well over. I think the last time I remember, there were twelve thousand pages. So, and that was fairly early on. So, um, it was. It. I don't know if. It, well, because we changed the website to be back to Queer Cultural Center it was a lot of that might have disappeared. I hope not, but we still have, yeah, we still have the first 10 years in Big Boy, so. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments? Yes. So my name is Dante Lencastre. I'm the executive director of the California LGBT Arts Alliance. And we actually are one of the children of the QCC in Los Angeles. Um, Greg Day was one of the, on the first boards of the QCC. And with Jeff Jones, when Greg decided to move to Los Angeles, said, we need to have something like this happening in LA. And I joined the board. I think we, we became a 5013C in 2014. And I joined the board uh, a couple of years later as a filmmaker, as a storyteller. And um, five years ago, I became the executive director. And we're still doing the work, you know. Uh, we're still nurturing 
young emerging LGBTQ plus artists. We do three, four, five events a year. Uh, we're doing a reopening actually on June 22nd. And because we have been, of course, laying low for the last two and a half years. And all thanks for the, for the work that you did. So it's not only in the Bay, in the Bay Area where you have endowed artists with nurturing and, and funding, but also in Southern California, LA in particular. Thank you. And, and also, I did, uh, I did notice when I moved to Austin, uh, and three or four years ago, I went to the Edge Festival, which was founded by people who, work, who were from here, <laughs> who were in Frameline. And they went to Austin. They started uh, a queer film festival, and now they do a perform an annual performance uh, festival that Rico was at the last time <laughs> yeah. I, when, I, when I was there. So. Madison Young. <laughs> yeah. Now we started a little bit late, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. And so if um, we have time for maybe another one, one more question, um, if anyone has a question or comment. Yeah. One thing I'd like to bring out uh, that has to do with digital again is that when we did the Spouses for Life exhibition, which was in here and at the um, LGBT Community Center as well, um, we had asked couples who were getting married to give us roughly 150 words and their favorite photograph from their wedding. And this was during that little tiny window where uh, queers were allowed to get married in San Francisco. Um, and that exhibition ended up sort of traveling the world because we, uh, Mindy, now Mendel uh, Boxer of BACW, Bay Area Career Women, I don't think that even exists anymore, but um, she created pages for each one of the spouses and what folks could do and what we encouraged them to do was to print them out and have their own exhibit. So I know for sure that we had one in Belgium, we had one in Göteborg, Sweden, it was in England. So several of the exhibitions when we opened up the work by having it be able to be digital and kind of DIY, it was, um, it was able to really travel and make an even wider um, impact. So that was very exciting. Sounds amazing. Um, anyone else? Questions, comments? Well, I guess I'll finish this up with my last comment, which was, this has been fascinating and amazing. And um, can we give one more hand to our <laughs> panel of founders? Oh, there is one more thing I want to bring up, which is um, Lenore mentioned him, but when we used to go across the street from the LGBT Center to a Chinese restaurant and meet and plot and foment revolution, we called ourselves the Gang of Four, and it was the three of us plus Rudy Lemke, who was an amazing curator and who just really brought um, people into this organization in myriad ways. So I wanted to recognize him as well, formally. <laughs>